Welcome everybody to our kickoff event. Welcome to the first ever Kinexon Live Talk with the topic, the future of football. My name is Lisa Ramoskat. I will be your host for today. And I'm more than excited that you tuned in because Kinexon has actually something very special to announce today. We will address this topic shortly, but I would like to, uh, you know, run you through our schedule today first. Because our program today consists of four parts. Part number one is the one where Co sorry, co-founder, founder Oliver Trinkera of Kinexon, as well as Nicholas Evans. I need to look up your job description every single time. Head of Football Research and Standards at FIFA will actually reveal the very special thing that we are about to talk about in part number two. We will hear about Oliver's partner in crime, Maximilian Schmidt, who is co-founder of Kinexon Sports Media. Um, how to dive a little bit deeper into the whole Kinexon universe. In part three, we will be joined virtually, unfortunately only, by three more guests. That will be Dominic Janssen, football player with the VfL Wolfsburg, as well as the, nat the national team uh, of the Netherlands. Then Lucas van Kranach, CEO and founder of One Football Club. RB Leipzig. We will discuss together all the developments and innovations that Kinexon has to offer. And lastly, we will be opening up our uh, circle, our panel for you at home, so we can uh, discuss everything together in a little Q&A session that hasn't been addressed yet. And um, I would suggest that we dive right into our schedule. Oliver, I would like to address or, you know, hand over the word to you. Why are we here today? Lisa, first of all, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And also from my side, a very warm welcome to our audience all over the world. Um, for me as a football fan, a technology enthusiast, but also last but not least as a founder of this company, this is a very special day. And I guess not just for me, also for the whole football and sports community. Uh, today we are proud um, together with FIFA uh, to announce a one of its kind collaboration in the field of live player tracking. In the context of this collaboration, um, Kinexon has been appointed as the world's first and currently only preferred provider for live player tracking. And um, what does this mean? So what's the purpose behind that? Um, our joint goal is that uh, together we want to bring digital evolution right to the football pitch and from there to the whole football community around the world. Mm -hmm. Our goal is really to, to drive the experience. I mean, we're living at a time where every activity is associated with the experience that you feel either as a coach or as a player or as a fan. And together we want to drive that experience to the new level, as I said, for all stakeholders in the, in the football universe. And while we do so, we want to preserve the spirit of the game. We do not want to change the spirit of the game, but really to bring innovation uh, to football. And how do we achieve this? In the end, we achieve this by bringing uh, digital technology to the field. We want to enable the stakeholders to get new fascinating insights, to make informed decisions in real time. But at the same time, we want to create also new fascinating insights that help the fans around the world uh, to increase their emotions, to increase their engagement with the sport. And in this context, Kinexon will contribute its core technology, which consists on the one hand side of wearable technology based on ultra wideband technology, on 5G ready GNSS technology, but at the same time also will contribute our know how in the field of analytics platforms. Wow, that sounds actually uh, quite groundbreaking. And uh, Nicholas, you are, as I already said, head of football research and standards at FIFA. So you are in charge of collaborations just like these. Uh, what qualifies Kinexon as the FIFA preferred provider, as Oliver just uh, explained to us? Yep. Thanks to you, Lisa, Oliver, for putting on this event in these times, not obvious. Um, I think we're really happy to be able to, to talk about this here today. Um, if I can take one step back, FIFA started looking at technologies and in specific um, these tracking technologies, which we call electronic performance and tracking systems, EPTS, um, in 2015. Back then, this was something that was, was coming up, up and growing technologies, and we wanted to see, okay, how can we leverage it for the good of the game, very much mm -hmm. like what, what Oliver was saying. So the first question we asked is, 
what do these systems do? How good are they? And so we've gone through five years of really validating with uh, research partners, with the industry, with our football stakeholders. And we feel that we've now precisely come to a point where it's about taking this all to the next level. We're confident that the data collection in itself has something that can be done uh, relatively accurately. Um, and now it's about, okay, how do we get the next level of quality out of the data? How do we get better live data to be used in game? Um, how do we interact more with our football stakeholders, the ones you mentioned, players, coaches, um, with our research institutes, but then also with the industry? And um, Oliver said it, uh, it's the first uh, collaboration of this kind, so the first preferred provider for electronic performance and tracking systems, but we hope the first of many. So for us, it's really important that we have an open uh, dialogue with the industry, um, that we look at the forward-thinking companies, I think that have a, a total solution, that share the vision, that are really leaders in, in innovation that really want to improve it. And I think for us, FIFA, the, the core part is not just to look at the top teams, but to make this also available to uh, as wide a scope as, as possible. So really the, the main qualification here, I think, is, is the, the, the innovation spirit, the thought leadership, and really the, the idea to want to improve the game, let's say, together with our stakeholders, together with us. That sounds that's so interesting. Actually, you said Kinexon is the first, hopefully, of um, many. You uh, already kind of touched what qualifies Kinexon for this special title. Maybe you can elaborate just a little more on what is important in order to become, you know, an FEP. I think we're, we're looking for, for companies that are obviously established in the market, um, that are credible towards um, our stakeholders, towards the clubs, but also that, that have a complete solution. So I think here we're, we're not only looking at the obsession of player and data collection, um, but it's the whole idea of um, data ownership going to the player. So how can, I, how can I deal with that? It's the whole value chain of putting analytics on top of it. Um, it's this idea of providing live data. So how can I actually make use of it? So really to, to go beyond the simple fact of I've collected data, here you go, do with it what you want, but really to, to try and uh, get that insight. And I think secondly, there's definitely an element of being able to adapt. So if uh, a coach or a player comes to you and says, I'm looking for this, that you have the, uh, the, the capabilities, the innovation, again, spirit to actually go and adapt the system and not say here, it's an off the shelf product, take it or leave it. So really this idea to, to be able to cater and in, in a way without misusing the word help shape the next generation of these devices that, that are geared towards the, the users. And I think that's something that we have found in, in Kinexon. There are hopefully uh, others to, to follow. Um, but here, we're happy to start this day, have this kickoff here today um, with, with Kinexon, and we're happy to found at least one partner in crime. Okay. Um, we, oh, I am hearing right now that we are facing a technical issue right now. So we are going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a second. Welcome back, everyone. We are very sorry for the inconveniences, but we're back now. We're hoping you can hear us now loud and clear. And um, to get you right back into the talk, Nicholas and I were, Nicholas Evans and I were just talking about um, how actually um, a company like Kinexon can um, achieve a title like uh, the FPP that we were just talking about. Um, Nicholas, now, what do you expect from a company that, you know, actually did achieve this, this special title? Yeah, I think it's it's actually to walk the talk. So not only say that you do innovation, but actually actually show it. So very much what I, what I was saying uh, before, that you show the spirit of innovation, that you invite the feedback, criticism sometimes, or actually go and seek ideas from, from the stakeholders and really help us develop solutions that, that help improve the game, game experience if we're talking about fans. Um, and again, for us at, at all level. So we're, we're not just looking to cater to the top five clubs, 10 clubs, but th that we can actually improve the way we set our standards, which is obviously part of the title that you will yes. need to look up a couple more times um, of, of how we uh, make sure that overall we drive the market for, for tracking systems um, and make them better. And obviously live is, is the big word that we're looking for here is that, that we can really start to get insights in real time. How can the coaches, the players themselves, um, fans, referees use this type of technology to try and improve the game while it's going on. Mm -hmm. Walk the talk sounds like high expectations, which uh, Kinexon can meet, uh, I suppose. Oliver, uh, FIFA certified the Kinexon player tag as interna international match standards. Uh, what defines this technology? 
Yeah, I think there are several perspectives on this topic. So first of all, there's a, let's say, a regulative perspective uh, according to which you have to comply certain standards when it comes to health, to safety, or also to the labor conditions under which this technology mm -hmm. has been created. And so it would be rather, I would say, a kind of a formal title. In a figurative sense, of course, defining a standard for us means means more than that. So when we started this company, we saw that uh, the content that was created in the sports industry was created with high latency. That's why we really like the word life, because it indicates one of the game-changing elements that we are about to launch. At the same time, we saw that there were different technologies that were differing in terms of quality. And if we talk today about trust in data, we have to mm -hmm. talk also about the precision that data brings to the pitch and to the stakeholders that use this data. And last but not least, I think a very important element that we saw at that point of time was that there was a huge manual effort involved in, in creating the data. And Kinexon has brought a lot of initiatives to the table in order to automate the way how this data is created, because through that automation, we can also democratize this, this technology in a certain sense and contribute to what Nicholas has said, mm -hmm. making technology available uh, to the broad mass. And I think that's one of the important key elements to, to also consider the aspect of scalability, because scalability in the end will let participate many stakeholders in this game and not just a few. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing that you, uh, Nicholas, said earlier too uh, was that FIFA promises to provide uh, guidance to clubs and leagues um, in the area of state-of-the-art technologies or, or technical ca capab sorry, capabilities. Here we go. Uh, what will that actually look like with live player tracking? I think pro promises we do our best. <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably uh, uh, okay. the, the safer way of putting it. No, the, the idea is, is to be able to, to guide clubs to understand when they're purchasing systems like this, what they need to look out for. You know, what is the right system for you? What are metrics that you might be looking at? Mm -hmm. um, how can we validate uh, the, these types of metrics? I think specifically the use of technology for a smaller club federation will help replace or that's uh, a nice, uh, not the nice word, complement yeah. um, staff in a way that you, that, or, you know, bring, bring in capabilities that you would otherwise not have um, without, without the technology. So I think that's exactly the, the point here that we can help uh, improve uh, even those who don't have the manpower, who don't have uh, the, the resources. So for us, it's really about providing the, the guidance of what systems are good. We're doing that at the moment with the, with the testing and, and validation okay. of the systems. And the idea is to just further develop that. So what does live testing mean? That's something you know that we still need to work on. You have the whole uh, system setup uh, that, that you're looking at. Um, and as I said, we have new metrics. At the moment, we're looking at X, Y positions. We're looking at velocity, which is a very good start. Mm -hmm. But then we need to look at accelerations. We might want to look at more um, tactical um, uh, elements. And then again, this live uh, part of it. So yeah, it comes down to what Oliver was saying around the accuracy, the validity of the system, not only absolutely, but then relatively speaking and, and to a purpose. I know it's not a very concrete answer, but that's particularly or precisely why we want to work with the industry to, to come up with good ways and good metrics of being able to say all you need to look at is one number or one color or one label so that you can then choose and say that's what I want and that, that's really why we need to have this collaboration if I could answer the question today then we wouldn't need to be standing here and talking about this. Uh, maybe you can get a little bit more precise though in my follow-up question uh, how can we imagine now this collaboration between FIFA and uh, Kinexon? Yeah, I mean, that's easy. Um, we, 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 <laughs> no, no, I think the, the idea is here. We, we would expect, um, and again, this is a, an open forum really for, for, for other industry. This is by no means mm -hmm. an exclusive deal. This is by no means a, a, a closed shop, but we would, we would definitely expect um, expertise uh, in resources. So I think we, we will form um, our own working groups where it's about deciding what are the, the ways to move forward. And that's where we would expect technical expertise. That's where we would expect um, really this, this industry side. So we, we often have this problem that technology doesn't understand the sport and the sport doesn't understand the technology. And I think we're trying to kind of merge mm -hmm. these together and, and really use the expertise from the industry that can tell us, guys, what you're trying to do doesn't work or you have to do this differently or have you thought about it? Um, I mean, we've, we've been discussing, you know, you go back a number of years, it was inconceivable that players would be wearing stuff. Yeah. And now it's more the question of what, what else do I put where? And it's also around, you know, the guidance um, 
where, where should we go with this? We also have questions with data uh, property. Who owns it? How do we make sure that data security is, is in place? You know, what, what are these guys doing to, to ensure players who want access to their own data go there? So I think there's a lot of work streams where here very concretely, we would expect to have access to the expertise of said industry partners to, um, to try and really move forward, build standards and really inform our stakeholders. So now we know uh, Nicholas's side uh, of the collaboration already. Uh, Oliver, maybe you can uh, sh show us a little bit of your approach to this whole thing. What can this uh, collaboration of Connexon and FIFA actually mean uh, for, you know, Connexon's technologies and products and services? Well, I think in first we have to say that I would agree with all the points that Nicholas has mentioned. Mm -hmm. Today marks the kickoff, so we're at the beginning of the 90 minutes. And we have a lot of work in front of us, but we have a clear goal really to shape the ecosystem and to provide clear answers and solutions to the whole stakeholder community. And those solutions have to be uh, sustainable. So one of the things that I really liked about the conversations with FIFA is that they have a very deep insight into the needs of the community, but not just a, let's say a community of the top clubs, but they have a, a global perspective on the football community. So uh, they include, I would say, a huge variety and diversity of, of different teams, uh, men teams, women teams, youth teams, the older teams, um, first league, second league, third league. So they provide, I would say, a holistic perspective mm -hmm. on that universe. And together with us, they share the ambition to, to create technology not just for, for the elite, but let's say for a broader set of stakeholders so that everybody can participate. And through that democratization of technology, I think we can make a huge difference in the future. And I would like to give you one example that I, that I really like because it's absolutely compelling. Um, if we take the example of injury prevention, mm -hmm. and as Nicholas said, there are some teams that can afford a huge stuff that uh, deals with this topic, but especially those clubs that have smaller budgets are in lower leagues or in regions that do not have the financial opportunity to afford them, technology can make a difference by measuring data in real time and giving you informed uh, opportunities or let's say substantiated decisions so that you can decide when you think that a player could maybe suffer an injury. And this will help you even though you do not have the financial power or the reputation, etc., to use, let's say, core elements of technology that help your team, the individual athlete, to stay healthy, to become better. And uh, the great thing about this is that um, this journey is now about to start. So mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of work in front of us. I think this is one of the aspects that we can use. And I think if you com combine the, the, the inside, the market intelligence or the user need intelligence of FIFA, together with the normative power to shape also certain standards within the industry. And on the other side, you take the technological expertise and the proven capability to translate technology into, into a benefit for the customers. Then I think you have a powerful couple that will be enriched also by other ecosystem players, as Nicholas said. And this is the way how digital transformation works nowadays. I really liked how you said uh, this is how the journey uh, starts or, or this is where the journey is starting. I would actually like to uh, take a couple of ste steps back. You founded Kinexon in 2012, way back with the you know overriding objective of automating uh, the collection of live game uh, data. Um, maybe you can give us a little uh, glimpse of how you feel your vision since 2012 uh, has changed. So I think we have to jump back and for the audience uh, that sees soccer today, those uh, the status quo from 2012 is maybe not so familiar anymore. That's why I'd like to jump back in time a little bit. And Nicholas certainly knows all those stories. Mm -hmm. But when we had a look at the industry, how our data was created and consumed, we saw on the one hand side that there were in training sessions, GPS devices, where the data was read out after a training session. So yeah. when, when it was already too late, because as we have learned today, it's important to make informed decision in the moment when it matters most. And that's why we're talking here about the topic of life, because this yes. enables you to, to do the next step better before it even happens. So before an injury happens or before a next move happens on the, on the pitch, you can directly interfere 
with the game. So this is, I think, one of the important aspects. And we saw also at that point of time how within the stadium environment, data was collected through, let's say, a huge effort of, of manual power. Um, at that point of time, I remember that anecdote that people were following the ball with the mouse cursor on the screen uh, in order to determine the ball position. That was mm -hmm. soccer technology in 2012. And we started, as you said, with the ambition to, to drive a new way of collecting the data. Uh, collecting the data, first of all, in real time, uh, collecting the data with the highest precision uh, and finding a way to make this scalable. So to bring it not just to the top club of each league, but to a broader, let's say, set of clubs. And this is how everything started. What we have realized along the way that is not just about um, the data collection. Transformation today means that you need to address the whole, let's say, creation chain. So not just collecting mm -hmm. data, but also processing the data and translating the data into meaning for the respective stakeholders, and then also distribute the data to those stakeholders. And there you have to follow a rather, I would say, individual approach because every stakeholder has a different need. So we talked about coaches today. We talked about the players. We talked about the federations and the leagues. But not to forget one of the most important parties in that game, the fans. So everybody mm -hmm. of us who loves the game and who wants to engage in a more emotional way in the future. And uh, this is how we have evolved over the time. And I think um, what we have learned along this journey is that there are certain, let's say, quality principles that we have to follow. A very important uh, word that, that Nicholas used was uh, privacy or data security. I think given that we have a very strong tradition in European data protection law, uh, this is one thing that we considered from the very first moment uh, by design. And uh, there are more aspects that we can certainly discuss later on in the discussion with the audience. Definitely. Uh, and I would say we actually take the next step to our next point right now. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Oliver. Thank you so much, uh, Nicholas, for this great opening, for the great introduction. I feel like we learned a lot. You said so beautifully learned along the journey. We definitely did learn uh, a lot as well. And Oliver, you're actually going to leave us for now. Thank you very much and all the best for the future and obviously for the FIFA collaboration. Thank you very much to you. See you later. <laughs> Okay, and we will actually not have to wait much longer because we are being joined right here by uh, Oliver's partner in crime, Maximilian Schmidt, who will now be so kind to uh, help us dive a little bit deeper into the whole Kinexon universe. Of course, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> um, Kinexon Sports, for the best experience and performance in sports and in particular in football, when we started in 2014 and equipped our first innovation partner with the technology, FC Augsburg, our major claim and promise to them was for the best performance and experience in sports. Since then, a lot of things have changed. We have 400 customers globally. We do a lot of things different than we did in 2014, but the one thing that stayed the same is our major promise is for the best experience and performance in sports. How do we do that? At Kinexon, we are a group of sports enthusiasts. We are tech lovers, um, but not experts in all the fields. But the one thing that we want to do is we want to help our partners to get new insights, valuable insights about football performance from different kind of perspectives, physical, tactical, and um, technical performance. And those kind of stakeholders can be a player, a coach, a club, or even the fan. And the one thing that is core to our philosophy, since we are not experts in all fields, is we work very closely together with our partners. We learn and educate at the same time. So on a daily basis, all of our customers give us feedback on our solution, it gives us feedback on how we can improve. We try to incorporate that in the current version of our solution and then go back to the customer, educating them how to use the solution the best way to get the most out of it. With the partnership of FIFA, actually, and the FIFA preferred provider uh, certificate, if you say so, uh, for pl uh, live uh, player tracking, we bring our journey to the next level, to the next milestone. And that is a particular honor and a great recognition for the hard work of all the Kinexon employees doing their job, increasing the value and experience for our customer. And also it's a great responsibility for us to continue our work for the innovation in football. 
when I look at the development of, of football and we as a company look at the development, the one thing that we clearly see is it becomes faster and it becomes more intense. And with that kind of professionalization of football, also the requirements of our technologies changed along the way. It became clear that data reliability is core to it. User experience, because time is so valuable to the coaches and the players, becomes key. And the insights and the content that we are providing, it needs to be instantaneously, so life is key. And those requirements define our major ingredients and characteristics of the solution that we are providing. It has to be very precise because context and credibility is key for our partners. It has to be auto automated because user experience and seamless processing of data and availability of data and information is key for our partners. And it has to be live because instantaneous feedback and content is key to our partners. And that ingredient really actually defined how we designed Kinexon 1. Kinexon 1, our product offering for our partners in football. And we prepared a quick video to illustrate that. And ingredients of that Kinexon 1 product are our core LPS solution that we became famous for that already incorporates precision, automation, and real-time readiness. But it accompanies now with a new innovation that we bring to the table, a 5G empowered GNSS solution that brings the same kind of, same kind of characteristics to the table and also adds the ability and capability of scaling it to multiple features and traveling across the world. And it all comes together in one platform that provides our partners with the insights on the performance side and then sums up to a great experience and great performance for our partners. This short video shall take about 90 seconds as it suits to a football scenario, <laughs> I would say spot on. While technology is the core of what we're providing, the applications of the technology actually make them unique and valuable to our partners. I want to focus on three applications that are currently in the most used. First of all, it's player health and performance. The second one is team football performance. And the third one, fan engagement. I take an example for player health and player performance. Our innovation partner, TSG 1899 Hoffenheim, they do a tremendous job helping their team to actually manage the hard workload in a season like this under circumstances of COVID-19. They managed to work with their athletes with on-field performance diagnostics to help young players to develop and reach a new level of top performance. And they're measuring return to play protocols for injured players to actually stay with on track and really help them to keep on their pace way back to competition on a healthy way. Second major application, really improving the way you play football. Our pioneers of Bayern with Leverkusen actually using not only player tracking, but also ball tracking in practice to really develop on the development of the squad by looking at the speed of the game, 
how quick their transition after they're losing the ball, how everyone is contributing to pressing, how is the difference between speed without or with the ball, and also like how can they increase the speed of the game and the ball movement of the players by keeping the same quality uh, of passing. And the final application that is very popular today is using the data actually to increase the fan engagement. How can I personalize the content and actually give me the perspective of the performance of my favorite player? How can I look at the development and actually performance of my fantasy team? And ultimately, I have a couple of questions watching Champions League and see, can my team keep up the high speed and pace of the game over the course of 90 minutes? There's still a lot of homework to do how we can make this game fascinating, even more fascinating through technology. But I think we are at a good starting point and we prepared another short clip illustrating those key applications. Spot on. Okay, that took longer than 90 seconds, I have to be <laughs> honest. We had to go through overtime to win this one. Um, when I look into the future, I think the one thing that I'm sure about is the future will be exciting. Football will be more digital. And through the help of technology, we can make it an even more fascinating game and engaging game for our fans. We're looking forward to be part of the discussion, help our partners to work on the future of football. And now let's kick it off and discuss what to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. That was uh, one impressive uh, presentation here. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely impressed. Um, and we will actually not discuss right away, but we will actually have another look in a short mood clip, which is supposed to show you or give you a better feeling for the further uh, potential of the Kinexon technologies.
that was a great one and we definitely saw a whole nother level of uh, the whole Kinexon empire there. It is the player and actually one of our uh, online guests uh, is already waiting for us because we are smoothly uh, transferring or transitioning into our next part of the show. We are more than happy to have you and she's right there already. Dominique Janssen, welcome. Oh, wait, we cannot hear you. We will wait another second. <laughs> Maybe we can figure that out. All right. Oh, now it sounds good. You hear me? Yes, perfect. Awesome. Welcome to the show. How are I you, Dominique? I just said hello. <laughs> Great to have you. Uh, so we have been talking, you know, all about live uh, player tracking and uh, data collection and all of that. You are, though, the only uh, ac active player here in our uh, circle of, you know, people who talk about this a lot. Maybe you can give us, um, you know, just a general feeling of what you actually think of all these technology entering your sport. Well, I think it has a lot of positives and um, I think we should just focus on the positives. Of course, football is still football and we don't want to focus too much about all the other things about technology. We still want to play and just have fun, but it can also have a lot of positives. For example, uh, for players to just track how they are doing, if they are being tired, um, also to prevent injuries, for example. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And um, I also think it's good, you guys talked about, for example, the pressing part. And I remember after the Euros, we also got a few statistics from the coaches. And so they also showed that we were being really compact. And that was also what made us successful compared to mm -hmm. other teams, which is mm -hmm. really interesting to see. And I think it can help also tactically to be um, to just be better. And if you see those things on the screen with, for example, a, a meeting with the team, that is something that you can train on and you can improve. And, you know, just become better as a team. Definitely. Thank you so much. And I already saw a couple of nods uh, over here. Maybe, uh, Nicholas, you, uh, we already, you know, talked about how we always just, or you guys, the FIFA and obviously Kinexon want to improve the game without, without harming it. Um, Dominique just said here that, you know, she actually looked already at some statistics. How can you feel that actually uh, that, that, you know, the technologies that we have been talking about can improve the experience of the player as well? They can't really argue with what the player is saying, and I think that's exactly why we we need to include them in in the loop. I think it's it's a fine balance between trying to understand how we can make the game better. Um, while you didn't mention negatives, of course there are some. We need to openly discuss what that means: making the devices smaller, making mm -hmm. you know less less uh, invasive. So there's a lot of these things that that we're looking for. But then, equally, yeah, what are meaningful metrics? Uh, mm -hmm. And the the work that we'd like to do as FIFA is to make sure are they are they valid? Are they accurate? So it's also that when the coach, when the player looks at uh, at, at this data, that it's actually reliable. That we're not seeing a speed of 84 kilometers per hour where you say uh, probably that was uh, that was wrong and so that therefore specifically for me i think it's important to understand what metrics we're looking for we heard things like pressing or mm -hmm. pressure is mm -hmm. something that's coming up we just need to make sure that we can also find a, a meaningful way of defining that and then also you know present it in a way together with the industry that, that actually makes sense yes. not only to the player but then the coach the fan as well and use that really as a means to to educate everyone so and actually, thank you so much for that perfect transition, uh, talking about the fans and including the fans, because we just have our next uh, live guest joining us right now, uh, who hopefully will uh, help us a little bit elaborate on the fan perspective here today. Lukas von Kranach, CEO and founder of uh, One Football. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Maybe you can uh, just dive right in and give us a little heads up on your general opinion on, you know, uh, data and technology entering the sports from the fan perspective, because, you know, one football does a lot for the fans, obviously. I'm thinking uh, firstly of, you know, the VAR that has been, you know, uh, not done well <laughs> uh, from the fan perspective. Yeah, so, so um, again, thanks for, for having me uh, today. And um, yeah, so OneFootball is the, the leading um, media platform globally for football fans. And we have 85 million monthly active users. And um, it's a fan-centric um, product offering. So everything what we do is about delivering the best service to the fans. And um, we are very proud, you know, to recently have added um, the, the best clubs on this planet as our shareholders with Barcelona, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, Liverpool, Arsenal, Chelsea, 
City, um, Juventus Turin, Olympic Marseille, Borussia Dortmund, Tottenham, etc. You name it, and the, the German football. <laughs> exactly. So um, that's been really tremendous because the idea was also why um, all these um, the 12 clubs and the German Football Association joined as shareholders was to deliver an even better value proposition to to and for the fans um, related to the content the fans have and which they are const uh, currently distributing on social media and it gets a bit lost and uh, as we're a football only platform mm -hmm. you know this is um, really down to I'm a Cologne fan unfortunately <laughs> so uh, and uh, a, a diehard Cologne fan. yeah so we're hoping we're still <laughs> And when we win against Freiburg, we're going to think about Champions League again. Of course. Um, um, even though it's not, uh, not possible. But I just want my Cologne content. I want, you know, the official news from Cologne. I want blogs, publisher content from Cologne. I want videos from Cologne. I'm, yes, partially interested in the league, but Cologne is what I'm interested in. And that's what, what I think it got a bit, bit lost uh, in the last years where it was mm -hmm. just like, Bundesliga to everyone and not, you know, a fan centric offering connected to clubs and, and leagues you're following. And that's what we're trying to solve. That sounds so interesting. And what I'm, um, you know, extracting out of there is basically that you uh, were trying to build a certain kind of trust, actually, to your specific audience. And I feel that trust plays a bigger role in this whole discussion here. I'm sure that, you know, Dominique, as uh, the active player, really needs to trust in the technology. And um, maybe to you, the next question, Max, maybe you can uh, give us a little heads up on how Kinexon had faced uh, like the trust situation with you know the clubs with the leagues um, who are you know uh, traditionally rather close to developments and innovations in the tradition of uh, football. How did you uh, you know manage to build the trust in order to actually implement your technology? That's a very good question, Lisa. I I think the most pressing thing in the beginning is like build up credibility because people mm -hmm. need if if you implement something new, you need to take them through what's the value for them. So why should players use that? And why it's a benefit for, for Dominique bearing a variable in practice, actually getting information about their, her health data, about your performance data. So it's all about building up that credibility, uh, reliable information that should be at hand, but also being able to communicate why it's worth actually investing time into, into things like that. And that's something that we learned a lot from the, from the MBA mm -hmm. uh, when we first partner there, the 76ers, they had like a performance, director performance, David Martin, and they used our technology to help their then injured star player, Joel Embiid, getting mm -hmm. back for competition. And the one thing that I learned there is like, it's all about communication. So it's all about involving the player way before Definitely. he had to wear the wearable, but keep helping him why we're doing that. And communication is so important to build up that trust and faith into technology and uh, that's what we are trying to learn from our partners and implement then when we approach new leagues federations or clubs yeah maybe uh, i can uh, give this over to you uh, dominique how what sorry and what do you feel would have to happen for you in order to you know actually be willing to uh wear a wearable that we just addressed or you know actually maybe change your game or your routine or your uh, practice your nutrition the the whole thing is very uh, holistic actually you know in order to trust the data and actually adjust your uh, your daily life to it yeah i think you just need to know the exact things that would help improve the game help improve the lifestyle just all the things that are you know connected with this brand so I think if we know why we get certain information and what it can do for us and how it can help us, that is for us really important. Because once you believe in it, mm -hmm. you can actually take the benefits from it, from it. If you don't believe in it, then we as footballers are like, okay, if we don't know what, the, what is the point of this, it's the same in the game. If we don't yeah. trust in the plan, then it's easy and we're just like, okay, then we don't, we don't look at it. But if we know, okay, this is important information because it will help in this way, then that is for us really important. And I think that that was also being said that if the research and everything is just being done well and the reason why we're doing it, mm -hmm. then it will have a lot of, yeah, a lot of benefits. Um, if you had to pick like one area of your play, of your uh, whole athletic uh, and, you know, life of a player, uh, what would be an area in which you would like to improve and could imagine using live data or, you know, Kinexon generated data? 
Well, I'm just generally generally a person that always wants to improve. I'm just all about, you know, improving the 1% a day. So if I get certain informations about, okay, how am I feeling today? And why am I feeling this way? How was my training slow this week? Mm -hmm. How does my strength training help me in, you know, performing the best on the pitch? What are the specific things that I need in my position? Like those are just things that are really interesting. And I remember my time at Arsenal, we also had a lot of technology in the gym, for example, with, with like a bar, we were just like seeing how quick are we just pushing the bar. Yeah. And that is something interesting because if you know, hey, I need to reach this level and I'm not there yet, then you can focus on it. So those things are just really interesting for us as players to improve just generally as a person because you want to be the, you know, the best version of yourself to perform the best on the pitch. So that would be really interesting. Very good answer. I, I'm sure your coach likes to hear that <laughs> too. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, Max, Kinexon focuses regarding the football part on uh, three areas. It's perform, technique, and tactics. Maybe you can give us a little insight here uh, what that can actually mean to the player, but maybe you can also, you know, uh, you know, try to uh, give it back to um, Lucas right there in order to, you know, actually explain how the better player can actually enhance the experience for the fan. It's a broad question. Lisa. It's a broad question, it's a broad I know. Question. But uh, I think we, we follow what the, our users want us to do. Like we started with a physical performance because that was the most accessible for our clubs, working on the health level, the fitness level of the teams, seeing how they can manage the hard workload yeah. throughout a season with multiple games and practice and not a lot of breaks in it. So how can I manage practice to keep my squad healthy? How can I prevent them from injuries? Yes. And And once we... We learned that we learned that okay but football is about playing football so we need to have mm -hmm. the contact of playing football that's yes. why we also worked on how can we track the ball and the whole game because if i run fast it only matters if i run fast if i'm going for the ball or if i make a specific tactical move that is demanded for me so that's why we in integrated also like tactical and technical applications to really like put the context of the game to it right and that's the point of it and i, I think in the end when I look at how the fan is experiencing at the moment data, we often focus on things like how many kilometers a player ran during 90 minutes. It doesn't really tell us a story about how much he contributed to it. So yeah. I think we can take to the next step. I think we can work on specific metrics that more like put contribution to the game, right? Not only goals and assists obviously are the easy ones to pick, even if you're not an expert mm -hmm. that they contribute. But I think even a defensive midfield player not scoring all the goals has an immense impact maybe on the compactness of the squad. And that is something that I'm, as a, as a real fan, yes. I'm really interested on the compactness yeah. of my team because I want them to stand stable and not getting a lot of goals in the own pitch. And Definitely. So and, uh, you know, I already tried to build up the question this way, Lucas. What um, would you actually, would like what type of data would you care about in order you know to entertain the fan and in order to enhance the fan experience you're also creating lots of uh, content on, on different platforms what is important for you here um yeah so so f first uh, very important we're a media platform and not a publishing platform so we are literally our content creation is very limited uh, because i believe that content creation is not a scalable business model, which is proven by, you know, lots of different companies who actually got in, a bit into turmoil with creating content because the return on investment doesn't work. So we're, um, we do create some content, but very, very um, limited, uh, in a limited way to leverage the output from all the content we get from the clubs, leagues, Federations, because besides the 12 clubs in the German Football Association, there are 125 clubs, leagues, and federations who have same, you know, where we have the same partnership relationship with, and they literally serve the content. And when we look at the data, um, we're working with a few, you know, data partners to serve, you know, all the content around statistics and, you know, match detail data. This is obviously something which is not, you know, used by the let's say the casual football fan, mm -hmm. yeah, it's for the hardcore fans looking into that data. I believe, um, you know, that uh, also, you know, players like Dominique use that data in order to, to improve their performance. Um, but for me, the, the data part is a, is a very, 
you know, it's it's a it's a good business, it's a big business, and I believe in it. But I wouldn't see that it's accessible to hundreds of millions of football fans globally. There we're talking, you know, the more people you look at, the the, the broader the, the data set is there they're re requesting. And um and then then you actually talk about professional football players and amateur football players who look into that data. And there I think it's massively valuable. And that's why we're serving some of that data too. Thank you so much, Lucas. Uh, Nicholas, you already reacted. Uh, would you like to share your thoughts with us? No, I, I fully agree, but I think for me, when we're talking vision, we're not talking two years' time, five years' time. I think the, the idea, as I said, is, is to raise the bar. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's equally to raise the bar around the conversation that we're talking about. We probably won't go down to the detail of saying, we'll look at how much a specific player lifted in training. That's probably slightly too proprietary. But I do think that the fan conversation should move precisely away from, hey, he ran a lot and he still lost 4-0, um, <laughs> and, and to, to maybe try and engage more and use data as a way, not only for the team, but then really also as a, as, as a means for the to educate, mm -hmm. I know it's it's always a <laughs> a bad word to use, but to educate the fan and the and the broader broader public. I fully agree that we won't get there across all the levels, but I also think as technology democratizes, as we get access at, at much more levels to this through apps, through um, you know AI, you might be able then to to replicate that. So I, I don't per se disagree, but I think for me the the vision is is clearly that we can actually start having conversations that are based more on data and less on on feeling or sort of subjective. Uh, uh, ex expert input. There will always be both parts. I, I don't disagree, and I can see you want to rebut to that. But um, I, I think that by by improving the data, we improve the conversation that we're having as well. Mm. Very well and said. Maybe, yeah, please I'm, go I'll, ahead. So I I think we're completely on the same page. But it's not about the data; it's about the translation of data into visualization. So because it needs to be accessible and communi uh, and 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 you know and you need to be in the position to communicate data and then it's content and context so and there i believe data and the data you're serving is tremendously valuable but you know um, especially the young young audiences they are not reading long text anymore they don't want to analyze themselves they just want to consume so I fully agree, you know, educating the football fan or, you know, saying that's the reason why, you know, that team won against that team based on look how, you know, the the, the uh, lineups were set, yeah, and how the players were moving, but then it's visualization and data is actually the support function for that. And that's why we're we're completely on the same page, but I think it's data plus visualization and then, you know, making it accessible to a broader audience. I think enabler is a nicer word of a support function. Enabler. <laughs> enabler. Fair enough. Let's let's take the enabler. Would you like to react one more time, Nicholas? No, no. It, it, it's semantics in the end. I think we we agree. Of yes. course, that you need to understand it, and I think education comes at all level. You need the right medium for someone to also be able to explain it. Yes. Um, again, that's what I would take in the broader term of education is also how do I present four million data points in a digestible way uh, yes. to someone and that's clearly one of the exercises again coming back to my kind of way we need to marry sports and technology a bit better and we yes. need people to understand one part and another so yes don't don't disagree and I, I think that the fan just goes along on that journey obviously less granular and that's I think what you were saying as well than the player the coach uh, then maybe the club the league and then of course the fan might not want the same degree of detail but yeah of course that's uh, um, uh, aligned in a sense, but yeah, it all starts with correct data. In that sense, I agree with the enabler term. I, I really liked uh, the picture of the marriage here. Maybe we can uh, take that to uh, move on in the conversation. Let's actually look ahead. Uh, you said um, we're not talking about, you know, uh, I don't know, two years uh, ahead in time, but let's actually take a broader look into the future. Um, maybe I will. I would like to give this one to you, Dominique. Uh, let's say in a five to seven years uh, ahead of time, what would you like um, your your data, the ideal data to be presented to you? Well, that's that's honestly a really good question. Um, it, it would just be really good if after a game or after a week, would we would get certain information that we can use to just use the following week to then improve again. So for example, if we played a game, it would be nice if we have certain statistics on okay, this is how we want to press and this is how well it went or this is what went wrong or these are the ways we need to to make certain runs. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting if we 
have that specific data. I think there's already a lot of data available, but yeah, it's just about, okay, how are you going to use it and use it in an effective way? Not that you're like overloaded with information, mm -hmm. but just have the right information. I think that is key because like we're talking about so many things and there are so yeah. many possibilities. Everybody wants something else. So if we could just have like, okay, maybe five, six things that, that is like, okay, this is how it went. This is our statistics. We're happy with this and this needs to be improved. That mm -hmm. would be yeah the ideal situation, I guess. Sounds very, very nice, very clear too. Max, maybe giving this question back to you, you know, as the data provider, uh, as one part of um, the, the situation here, um, how would you um, describe or see the future? Let's even take it maybe even to, I don't know, in 20 years. In 20 years? Yes. I have no idea what's going to be in 20 years, uh, to be frankly honest. I think as, as as mentioned with data as an enabler, mm -hmm. I think we have live data available. The yes. data is there. The next step is like translating the data into meaningful insights and yes. valuable content so that even Lucas likes to have <laughs> content about I statistics. Not <laughs> Max, I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> and uh, I think the one thing that comes together is now, I think we have the availability of live tracking data mm -hmm. at hand. We have uh, supporting and enabling further technologies like 5G coming up. And so the one thing that we're talking about for years now, when will the augmented reality Googles mm -hmm, arrive, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there were Google classes in the past that didn't work out, maybe it was too early, but I think we, we had a stage where it's very likely that something like that will be available. And that is an, an application that can be used by players, coaches and the fan, right? The coach can stand next to the pitch watching his or her team playing and having like instantaneous insights yeah. on the performance of the squad and can communicate and interact directly. It can also be used by the by the fan at home watching or in the arena watching the game and having like not defocusing on the real game by taking your smartphone but actually having the information with, within your site. I think that's something that we will experience in a couple of years way earlier than in 20. Okay, I will definitely ask you in maybe five again about this one. And as we can see, our uh, third talk guest just joined the, uh, the, the, the call, basically. <laughs> Welcome, Julia Nagelsmann. How are you? Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you, so, thank you so much. I'm fine. Thank you. Hope you too. Definitely. We are, uh, you know, very deep into uh, data talk already. And I guess this is definitely your topic. You are known as, you know, the generation of the laptop uh, coaches, for sure. Um, maybe you can uh, give us just a, a broad step into this conversation and give us a feeling of uh, what, what data means to you as a coach. Uh, I try to. I try to. Uh, I think data is a big topic and... Uh, become a bigger topic in the future. Um, I think in the future, it's very important that you not only train the whole team, it's always important as a manager uh, to focus on uh, the individual players and um, to control these things uh, by data is important. Um, I listened to the conversation mm -hmm. about two or three minutes ago and uh, heard something about certain runs after the training or <laughs> to control um, the effort of, of the guys and to control the training. It's still a big topic for me, but also I think the future become more important to control tactical things. I think that's the most important topic for me as a manager to work um, with Kinexon and other systems and, and uh, with the coaches to get more information about the tactical things. Uh, I think uh, every manager and every trainer has its own philosophy and uh, their own detailed things, uh, thinking about soccer and thinking about training and uh, thinking about the games. So at the end, I think uh, the most topic are uh, tactical things for me. Um, it's also important to control physical part of the game and uh, the physical part of the training. But um, I think to improve the player in the future uh, a bit better and uh, to improve them more, it's more important to focus on tactical things. Uh, I'm not sure what we what we can see in the back of your of your uh, whiteboard. There <laughs> could be some of the tactical things you just mentioned. Uh, maybe you can uh, also give us. Um, a, a broader uh, insight on how you at RB Leipzig are actually working with the data that you are um, collecting right now. Do you um, decide yourself what you would like to use? Do you have a team? How, how does it work? Yeah, I have a team. I have uh, specialists in my team uh, who try to analyze the data. We still control uh, the physical things on the pitch. Uh, we have uh, strength and conditioning coaches who have an iPad on the pitch and we control the data. 
of the training session. And uh, after the training session, um, we put the data into our laptops and then with a good control um, about the effort of the guys. But uh, at the end, um, because of the, the LPS, uh, because of the tracking possibility for the ball, I think it's important we try to improve the tactical things. Uh, it's important for the system to learn um, what is a ball winning moment, to learn what is a ball losing moment, to learn what is counter pressing, what is a counter attack. And so if you can um, get some data about the tactical things, you can improve the player because uh, I think the physical data are only for controlling and uh, perhaps for doing some additional things after the training session. But the more important thing is to get uh, tactical things to improve the player in detail things, what he has to do on the pitch, what he has to do in the game and different positions and different uh, situations during the game. I think that's the most important topic. It's uh, still a long way to go because it's not that easy for a computer to know uh, the different tactical things. And especially uh, when you when a club uh, will have a new manager, then there will be perhaps a new philosophy. So it mm -hmm. should be a short period when uh, the computer could learn new things and some uh, other detailed things about the tactical thing. And then uh, you have the possibility to improve the player a lot. Before you joined us here, we were actually talking about what the football in uh, maybe 10 to, to 30 years, it was a broad time span there, uh, might look like. And, you know, you have all the experts here right now. Uh, what would you actually like the future uh, in terms of data for you personally as a coach look like? I think the most important topic for me is that it's still uh, working with, with people, um, mm -hmm. not only working with laptops. I think the conversation with your players and the... The feeling um, of the manager is still the most important topic and I think the data should uh, give you a bit more impact and should help you as a manager to work with your players but uh, uh, I think the most important topic is still the, a good relationship and uh, try to, to look and try to focus on the players, uh, focus with your eyes and uh, try to make your own thoughts. And then mm -hmm. you can control your thoughts, your feelings by data. I think that uh, should be a big aim for the future. Um, I think uh, there are there will be more data in the future, more and more data and uh, more chances to control your feelings. But uh, the most <laughs> important topic for me, and it's a big aim for my future as well, is still the good relationship and the conversation with my players. That's uh, definitely uh, the goal for sure. Maybe uh, one question to you right here, Nicholas. Can you actually imagine, though, all the components being combined or connected at one point? I think that's out of the question that you'll be able to do it. Obviously, you won't replace that that human factor. I think you will be able to bring a lot more data uh, in, in, into one place uh, at, at one time, and that can be different wearables. I mean, we've talked about interoperability of, mm -hmm. of data sets. You can bring your own uh, Fitbit. You can bring all of these devices um, together. But of course, at, at the end, and I think that was the, the conversation that we started to have before, the data won't win the game. Yeah, uh, you can you can bring things together. It will give you information. You'll be you'll be able to um, to, to make assumptions, right, wrong, what, whatever they might they might be. I just think it comes back to this idea of enabler, and I think the the point that was made, which is very very valid here, is also to say that's why we need this innovative spirit. You can't just force a product on a, onto a coach or a player. You have to be adaptive, reactive, and be able to to change de depending on what the needs are. Mm -hmm. And who knows what the needs will be in two, three, five years, depending on what, what data is available. So mm -hmm. for me, yes, I believe that we will have a lot more uniform uh, or the data, let's say, put in, put in one place, um, which will help specific processes. But again, it's not for me to decide who will win or lose. <laughs> Uh, the game and therefore that's why we have players coaches that ultimately yes. will still be on the pitch but again we come to this function of enabling supporting however you mm -hmm. want to mm -hmm. want to put it with technology that's as good as it can be and i think that's that's exactly what we're aiming for here to make sure that the technology is valid and it works it's reliable and, and it provides the insight ideally as non-intrusive as possible i guess that's the yeah. the next level if we can make the sensors disappear or invisible or not felt then of course we're going in the direction and oh yes, would you like to add something? I, I guess that's the homework for us now, like yeah. uh, being able to process the data into insights that are seamlessly available for the coaches to communicate because they want, Julian said he wants to focus on communicating with his athletes, his players to make them better on all level. And we just have to provide him with the information that he needs, that he uses the information maybe in the communication aspects. And I. I made the bold statement that maybe in five years a coach will have augmented reality glasses next to the pitch. Um, I remember when we first went to a, a Hoffenheim a couple of years ago that Julian had his yeah. giant screen <laughs> next to the practice uh, yeah. pitch 
um, uh, is that is that a scenario that you can imagine that in a couple of years you're standing on the pitch and having like mm, uh, Google's sort of augmented uh, information coming uh, to your head and use that information and communication directly on the pitch with players? Yeah, I think it's it's a brilliant idea because um, it's also an important topic that you get the data as soon as possible. Uh, the best uh, the best topic is if you have the training session and you want to um, improve your player during a situation, a special a typical situation, and you get the information as soon as possible. Um, so on glasses or on, on an iPad or something like that, it's still the best thing. Um, I, I think um, I do not have the biggest impact if I get the data after the training session. I think uh, in, in that moment when I have to improve my player or when I interrupt the training session, I want to improve him, then I have to get the information and then it could be a, a big step for the future. I think, Lucas, you raised your hand before. Did we cut you off? Yeah, yeah I think to, just to pick up on uh, what Max said with enabling, and that's, I think, you know, and also what, what Julian said, I think the importance in data is to be data informed and not data driven, and that data helps you to, to you know, to get more accurate on your your predictability and and on your forecast. And, and it's, it's something where I think it's always going to be the combination, that's why I'm saying content and context, uh, it's always going to be the combination of, of the data um, and then, you know, what you make out of it or how you interpret it or how you communicate it. And, and therefore, um, sticking, you know, what, what Max said, I think data should be the enabler. And I 100% foresee, you know, that uh, that's also something when, when we have the exclusive rights for the Bundesliga and Brazil and, and whole Latin America and um, and what what we're now doing is that we, we want to move away from you know this just linear broadcasting a signal mm -hmm. we want to make it first of all for the young audience a match experience where you can invite five people and then you share you know the match and you have five screens you know where you talk about it and then data should be an enabler to understand the match better for those users mm -hmm. so that next to the, the 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 broadcasting the live stream data has to play an important role to interpret what's happening on the pitch and that the the group of the the people who are doing this match uh, you know watching the match together that they can select the data they say let's let's you know let's try and see how many kilometers kilometers did the defense players you know what what tackle responses i don't know you know all mm -hmm. the the, the yeah. and i think that is something which is crucial uh, in a in a future experience for 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 customers. Definitely, and as you were just uh, you know describing, looking at the players and at the kilometers uh, ran on the pitch, and maybe one more question to you, Julian. Um, have you ever actually changed your opinion about a player based on data rather than on what you saw? Has that ever you know <laughs> differed or? supported each other no not really no not really um I, i'm happy with my feelings uh, just to control okay. my I just control my feelings and try to get a bit more impact uh, when i watch training session then uh, most of the time i make notice um with a pencil i'm not only laptop uh, <laughs> and, and, and whiteboard as we can see <laughs> <laughs> and after that, I control uh, my feelings uh, by by having a uh, look on the data. So I think that's important. But it's also where I think we missed one big topic. It's analyzing the opponents. Uh, mm -hmm. Also a big topic uh, for mm -hmm. data because it's getting more complicated in the future. Because um, I remember, I don't know, six years ago when I started as a manager in the Bundesliga, mm -hmm. nearly every opponent play the same formation, 4-2-3-1. And it was not that easy to analyze them. Uh, not, that, not that complicated to analyze them. And now... Nearly every opponent play different formation, uh, attack at different uh, levels, um, play different style of, of soccer. So it's not that easy to analyze them. And if you have uh, data uh, for analyzed opponents, also may help you and uh, may make the uh, process uh, for analyzing the opponents a bit, bit faster and a bit easier. And it will be also a big topic for the future, not only to work uh, with your team and with your players, uh, also to work um, as an analyzing tool with big data. So any specific wishes uh, to connect on maybe right now <laughs> that you would like to present to them? I just just work uh, still work on uh, to get tactical things out of the of the data topic. I think that's uh, the most important topic for me because all the physical parts um, yeah, we have a, a good and a big overview and uh, it's, it's still easy to control all the physical parts of training and the game. Um, but for me as a young manager and for me as a manager who 
like to do training sessions and uh, like to improve the players uh, by training. It's important to get tactical information and uh, just still work on these tactical information. And then I think the, the effort will be and then the, the outcome will be brilliant for us. That's noted. I, I keep you posted. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> hope so. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, just received a little note on my ear that we will have to let you go again. Julian, thank you so very much. It was our pleasure having you. Thank you for making You're the time. Welcome. You're welcome. No problem. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 And um, what I found super interesting, actually, and I would like to direct this question one more time to Dominique, uh, because Julian mentioned and stressed, actually, a couple of times how it's totally irreplaceable to have um, a personal you know connection relationship with the players um, you from you know from the players perspective maybe you can tell us maybe how you can see like the limits of data actually that can occur in the player to, uh, coach relationship yeah like Julian mentioned I also agree with him that the human part is still so important because you cannot substitute the human part with like with data so for example just the communication between the coach and the players this is something so important because you need to know why someone makes a certain decision so mm -hmm. if you're not happy about why you're not in the starting 11 or why you're not being in the squad if he can then talk to you that's irreplaceable so i think it's good to have a lot of data and have specific things and also analysis for the opponent and your own team um, I don't think that the human part will be able to be replaced with mm -hmm. with data. So you will still have that line. And I think it's good to have that line still, because like we said, we just want to play football. I want to have fun. So it's not all about data, but you can still use it in a positive way. You are nodding your head so so actively, Lucas. Would you like to add something to that? Yeah. But I, I, fully, I fully agree. And I, I think uh, um, uh, probably that's the reason why, why Dominic is such a good player. Um, because uh, she she just you know one thing is to be intuitive and you know play you know how you feel and be happy with the sport. Uh, I was a football player. You don't see it anymore t today, but in my in my in my <laughs> young. Um, but I was intuitive and I was missing the you know the strategic part, which I think is the data informed part. And I think you know when you onboard that to your play, then you become a world class player like Dominique. That sounds very well. And maybe uh, I will. I would like to touch one last uh, little area before we come into our Q&A session. Um, one thing that I'm not sure who mentioned it earlier, maybe it was uh, Lucas, maybe it was you, you Nicholas, um, talking about uh, amateur players. And maybe we can uh, face one last time uh, the situation of, you know, how amateur um, actual football players can maybe use in the future, probably not currently, these type of data as well. What role can this play for, you know, a rather low level type of sport? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, picking up on, on, on Julian's point, the whole idea of if we can determine more tactical insights, um, and that's obviously generated by the use of artificial intelligence, by training these, uh, these devices to, to understand more. That trickles down. So if you have it at an elite level, you'll have a Kinexon system, you'll have a, um, you'll have some state-of-the-art systems that are there. But obviously, the insights that we generate from that can then also be applied at a, at a much lower level. So if you then have a, a much more rudimentary setup, you can still get a sense of what do I need to look for. Because I guess that's the question that we're asking about these tactical things. What is it that we need to find out? How how do I manage to get a tactical edge about it? And I guess that's the the whole idea of this innovation, of this uh, uh, um, evolving, of this shift that where we're going. Um, and ju just to the point, uh, if, if I may, to, to add a bracket, I fully agree that it's it's a human game. Yeah. But obviously, society is evolving. Um, you know, who, who goes and asks for directions today on the street when you have Google Maps on your phone? So similarly, I think there are, there are trends that are coming into there that you know, we, we will know a lot more about our bodies just because of the apps that we have. So it's also about how, how we keep up with it. And, and that, I believe, you know, helps democratization of, of the technology just because the, the, the tech stack that's going to be there is going to be much more affordable, much more widely spread. Mm -hmm. And I think it's precisely by being able to get insights at this level and through this idea of education that you'll be able to, to benefit a, lot, uh, uh, a much larger 
um, group down to the amateur players. And I think one that's often overlooked, it's also kids. Because I think parents yeah, cool. parents will become data obsessed about their five-year-old, 10-year-old, <laughs> you know, may, maybe too obsessed and run to scouts and try and, uh, try yeah. and get them there. But yeah, I, I think this is- Tell them the next name are. Sorry, Lucas. They are obsessed already. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but you will- and, and it would just help improve those those data sets by having you know the the state of the art systems um, developed. Yeah, interesting. Max, would you like to add something to that because you know it kind of uh, touches your Kinexon area as well. Can you imagine um, your technology being you know able to, uh, or or provided for a broader audience too? Absolutely. I think we're already working on that, making a more scalable solution that can be distributed to a broader range of, of customers, not only elite teams, but rather than also second, third, fourth tier teams, yes. maybe amateur teams in the future. And the first step is like looking at the elite and see what are the demands of football today, like what are the demands of playing on a level like Dominique does in terms of how many ball contacts you have, what's yes. the speed of the game, how much time you have actually handling the ball before you pass it over to your uh, player and mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. is what amateur players and, and, and youth players can learn from and see what's the gap where they have to go through so it's a transparency that they have at hand and where they can have like a clear path okay I want to become Dominique that's where <laughs> I need to go sounds perfect so we're, we're hopefully uh, facing a whole lot of uh, Dominiques very soon and i would suggest that we actually move on now and open up our circle here to the user questions i have uh, been watching and i feel like there have been some questions coming in for sure first one to dominique perfect oh i have bad eyes <laughs> the question is dominique how do athletes prefer to be tracked wearing hardware sensors and if yes where chest arm soul sensors maybe or only video tracking so you don't have to wear anything attached to your body at all. Interesting. That, that's a really good question, honestly. I think the one where you're being video tracked is really good because yeah, you don't need to wear anything. Mm -hmm. But nowadays you have also a lot of just little things. So for example, you have these bras where you can put in a chip in the back of, the, yeah. of your bra. Yeah. I think that's a really good one and it's also pretty secure. So it's like uh, information that you can trust instead of you have certain systems where you where you wear, for example, a heart sensor, and it also tracks how fast you run and how much you run. But I'm not sure how how Actually. precise those mm -hmm. informations are. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, the the most the best thing for a football player is to not have to wear anything. Yeah, obviously, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, the next question goes out to Nicholas. You mentioned that you chose Kinexon as FPP. Does this mean that you expect other providers to deserve this title as well? Yes. <laughs> I think, again, the, 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 the concept yeah. of deserving, choosing is probably the, the wrong wording. Yeah. I think we yeah. started off this journey and it's very much like Oliver said, and we hope it lasts. Um, I think we, we found the values that we were looking for in Kinexon, but yes, by all means, uh, I don't have the time to name all the potential um, market actors there, but yes. I think it's uh, it's exactly the idea that we would like those that are really thinking forward and would like to go on the journey with us to to, to join us. So there's no point uh, in in the two of us sitting down and shaping the future of football. We need a much much bigger <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, group. Well, we need a much bigger group around the table that will be able to interact then with with football stakeholders, with fan stakeholders, mm -hmm. with all of this. So yes, by all means, and the fact that uh, we we've kicked off here, you have to start somewhere. Um, so this, for me, is, is a very positive ground zero, but yes, yes. by all means, uh, we, we want to grow this industry consultation group. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this person hasn't been with us from the very beginning because we briefly touched this already. Uh, next one goes out to you, Max. Is Kinexon technology already implemented in other sports? I know you mentioned the NBA earlier. Yes, we, we do serve mostly team sports, football being the first one because we are in Munich and we all grew up with football and played it <laughs> ourselves uh, but we do a lot in basketball we equip like 75 percent of the NBA a lot of college teams basketball we do hockey mm -hmm. ice hockey just to be said particularly here in Germany yeah. uh, we do handball and we do also American football so we mainly focus on, on team sports Thank you very much. The next question is one to everyone. Let me read it out first. What, oh, I can't read the question. What role will predictive anal analytics play for coaches in the future? Predictive analytics. Okay, um, maybe I will start out with you again, Max. What do you think? 
too bad Julian already left us again. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a perfect question for Julian. Mm -hmm. and I, I try to answer it from a coaching perspective. I think, <laughs> in in as he said, preparing for the next opponent is important. Yeah. You want to predict what he's going to do, even though you don't know exactly what he's going to do. And he might change within 90 minutes of football. I think that's when we, when you look modern football, you see teams changing their tactics within, after the half break, after 20 minutes. Uh, but uh, watching like historical data and historical video can help you like predict a bit the outcome. So I think it's already part of it. And with only improving what we're doing, mm -hmm. I think we, we get a bit more precise and more accurate. That's actually the perfect uh, transition to the next one because um, it's also a question about how small the sensors might become in 10 years. It's again the, the big future question here. I think there's the saying that... Uh, that it's it's really a computing power like doubles every two years kind of thing mm -hmm, so i don't mm -hmm. know if you can translate that into making devices smaller every two years but i'm I'm pretty sure that sensoric becomes flexible so not uh -huh. only hard so mm -hmm. it will be uh, softer in a way and obviously it will be way smaller so it it, it, it won't be felt and maybe completely interwoven into Ooh, textiles so you don't have it separately so it's yeah. all about integration and, and a seamless experience but a precise prediction about the size of the sensor I'm not feeling comfortable with that, with that okay i'm not going to uh you know dig deeper here uh, i am having trouble reading the questions because there's uh, this thing on the screen no maybe you can just if we can reduce it, down. it a little yes and put it a little bit down Something about injury Yeah, a main prevention. topic is prevention of injuries. <laughs> I'm patient. I will just wait a little bit. <laughs> but maybe this one's uh, to Dominique, actually. Which options uh, does Kinexon provide to get uh, real-time information or warnings for individual players in relation to defined limits while training on the pitch? Let me reread it. This one's uh, for you, actually, Max, not for Dominique. <laughs> Main topic is prevention of injuries. Which options does Kinexon provide or do pre Kinexon provide to get real-time information or warnings for individual players while training on the pitch? Wow, those are deep questions. We're, we're facing a rough crowd here. It's the basic uh, functionality is to to provide tools to the coaches. So one of the most used features is like goal setting. So mm -hmm. you kind of identify and know your players best as an athletic coach um, because you have baseline values and you set particular goals in the context of the current fitness level of a player or this stage of the season. And while providing those real-time analytics, if you reach 100% of that goal, you get like a warning signal or like an information that you're basically achieve what you wanted to do and then you can react towards that. So it's like incorporating contextual information about the historic data of the athlete and then using the real-time data to, to provide like uh, recommendations on, on when to act. Uh, but we will not train the coach to react. We will provide <laughs> him with the information and still the coach will make the decision. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me see if we have another question from the audience. We already had those. Do we have another one for Dominique, maybe? No. This is, um, oh, how much would um, a sensor cost approximately? Was that a question? <laughs> maybe you can. Well, we don't sell the sensor as a, yeah. a unique uh, yeah. item. We have packages for teams. So it's it's never like a sole sensor. So at the moment, it's a team solution. So if a yes, team decides to go with Kinexon, they pay like a, a yearly license fee yes. uh, for the software usage and, and the hardware that we're providing to them. And in the future, maybe we'll offer like also like an individual sensor that you can buy, but that yeah. is not on the market yet. Thank you very much. I, I just received the little message into my ear that we don't have any um, more questions left. Uh, do you guys have any questions before we close our lovely talk here? Maybe amongst each other? No. So maybe, Dominique, are you winning the German championship? I like this that year? one. <laughs>
Well, honestly, this is a perfect question at the perfect time because we play this weekend Bayern Munich and if we beat them, then we're going on top. So it's going to be a big week ahead. Oh, it's going to I be. Imagine. We are definitely crossing our fingers for you, Dominique. Thank you so much for joining Thank us you. today. It was great having you. Thank you for your expertise, Lucas. Same for you. We appreciated your time. Your your fan perspective here was great having you guys. Take care. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks. you guys. Thank you. Bye. And um, yeah, I would say that we are rounding up or that we should be rounding up our little talk here as well. Thank you very much, Nicholas Evans. It was our pleasure having you, Max, for giving us all the insights from the Connexon perspective. Um, yes, and obviously to you at home, thank you very much as well for tuning in. We are hoping that you definitely enjoyed our kickoff event here and that you, you will tune in in the near future as well. Thank you very much. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you.